kids see things and do things that have an impact on the world. And there's a lot of them out there. And even if you don't buy that kids have an impact on the world and the events in history, you do have to concede that eventually those kids are going to grow older and become adults that will really shape the world. And the experiences and the memories that they have as kids are going to shape them and influence them when they do have a chance to impact history as adults. To me, there is much to admire about the mind of a kid. Kids are always there. They're always watching, absorbing, learning, willing to adapt and learn new things before they reach that age where opinions get crystallized and views become entrenched and tolerance fades. But anyone who's been around kids also knows another truth about them, that they can be incredibly cruel and mean. And to me, the psychology behind why that is, is fascinating. Because throughout history, kids have been at the center of major historical events. And having to deal with the psychology of those events and the burden of history, they've had to deal with that just like everyone else. But often there's very little coverage about how those events impact them. I think if you took your average history textbook, you might see something about child labor during the Industrial Revolution, but that would probably be it as far as mentioning how children impacted society and how society impacted children in your standard history narrative. But all of that is going out the window in this episode. We're going to look at a memoir from the Cultural Revolution in China by a woman named Ji Li Zhang. Because during the Cultural Revolution in China that started around 1966, kids were manipulated, weaponized, and heavily involved in one of the most convoluted and sinister movements in all of history, and it was known as the Cultural Revolution. I am planning on doing a little bit of a series on some of the ins and outs of the Cultural Revolution and some some more of the details there, but I do think a little bit of background is in order to understand G. Lee's journey in her book, Red Scarf Girl. So as we know, after World War II in the late 1940s, early 1950s, Mao Zedong and his Communist Party essentially took control of China and began the process of turning it into a communist state. And I won't go too much into this because I already did an episode on it, um, actually a couple episodes, I believe it was episode 14, on The Great Leap Forward. So The Great Leap Forward was a program initiated by Mao uh, that essentially implemented his version of communism throughout China, collectivizing farms and big public works projects and quotas for industrialization outputs. The idea was for China to take a great leap forward and join the ranks of Britain and the United States and some of these other more industrialized countries. Well, as we know, and as I talked about in those episodes earlier that you might want to go back and revisit, that's not how it worked out. Tens of millions of people would die of famine and starvation and disease and executions and torture and you name it. Eventually the Great Leap Forward sort of petered out and some of the less radical elements of the party began to try and correct some of the errors that happened during the Great Leap Forward. So some historians see the Cultural Revolution that started in 1966 as a response to the horrors of the Great Leap Forward and the negativity surrounding it, and Mao's kind of embarrassment and diminished position as a result of more or less spearheading the Great Leap Forward. 
So Mao's idea was to have a revolution of the culture as an attempt to purify the party and purify the government and really purify all of China of any elements that weren't deemed appropriately communist or appropriately revolutionary or appropriately supportive of workers and the working class. So in some ways, it was Mao's response to the growing power of others in the Communist Party, also his dissatisfaction with the progress of what he saw as the Communist Revolution in China. A lot of this is laid out in the foreword to the book Red Scarf Girl by David Henry Wang, who is a Chinese playwright, who also writes, quote, Ironically, had Mao died before launching the Cultural Revolution, he would surely be remembered today as a much more positive historical figure, end quote. As I just kind of laid out, and as anyone who knows anything about the Great Leap Forward or anything that Mao was doing before the Cultural Revolution, that's a completely ludicrous statement, but it does indicate what's coming here. Because Mao's cultural revolution, where he attempts to purify the party and purify society and get everyone on the same page, is going to be a horror show. A couple things to note before we get into G. Lee's story and the story of what happened to these kids and what these kids did and just the incredible way that it unfolded and the horrific way that it unfolded. It's important to make note that this story is a memoir told through the eyes of G. Lee Jang. And whenever you have a historical memoir like this that is remembering very specific conversations with long paragraphs of text and specific details of conversations, you have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt because you might think there's no way that she could remember every specific detail of all these conversations from so long ago. But that being said, maybe she can, and maybe she's just an incredible human being that way, and maybe the spirit of what's going on and the events can still be relatively accurate, especially when you consider all of the corroborating evidence that indicates things that were happening in the Cultural Revolution that back up a whole lot of what G. Lee says in her story here. So I think the first thing to understand about G. Lee is that she was a survivor of the Cultural Revolution because you didn't just experience the Cultural Revolution, you survived it. Before 1966, as a 12-year-old 6th grader, G. Lee describes herself as happy, trusting, rarely doubting what she was told, and believing in Chairman Mao. So these sixth grade kids would show up to school. The first thing they did was stand up and do these kind of sing-along songs and learn different slogans that glorified Chairman Mao. And you had to dress appropriately with the red scarf and the red gear and all of that type of thing. So as a sixth grader, G. Lee is kind of drinking the Kool-Aid and all in for this cultural revolution. Something happens at school where she gets the opportunity to join a sort of like an arts academy traveling dance type of thing for the People's Liberation Army, the Communist Party, and she kind of gets an audition and is hoping to be able to join and kind of do dance and theater for Chairman Mao. She runs home and tells her dad this information, and the dad kind of shatters her world a little bit when he informs her that they aren't going to pass the political background investigation, so she might as well just forget about doing it. So G. Lee had never realized this before, but her grandparents were landlords, so they owned land and property, and employed workers, things like that, before the communist revolution. And of course, landlords are seen as public enemy number one for Mao 
and the more radical elements of the Communist Party, because it's all about glorifying the working class and punishing the landlords and all those property owners for years of so-called exploitation of the working class. This conversation that she has with her dad about this is the moment where she realizes that not everything is as it seems, and she might have to put some of her childhood dreams aside because of her family's background. And this moment sets up a lot of the themes of the memoir, but also some of the themes of the Cultural Revolution in general, where G. Lee is now going to have to navigate this territory of, am I loyal to the party and Chairman Mao, or am I loyal to my family and my tradition and my roots? Because as we're going to see, it's virtually impossible to do both during the Cultural Revolution. Ultimately, G. Lee would decline the position because of her family's background, and from there, the Cultural Revolution, for G. Lee at least, would begin with the destruction of what was known as the Four Olds in China. So the Communist Party called these old customs, old cultures, old habits, and old ideas. Anything that represented these old ideas would be eliminated. So you can imagine some of the religious traditions, some of the old cultures, nods to old imperial dynasties or family traditions or private property, things like this would be very frowned upon during this period where the four olds were being destroyed. G. Lee saw firsthand as roving bands of revolutionaries went door to door tearing down anything that they deemed to be four old businesses, signposts, people, and replacing them with new ideas that represented more of what the party was trying to get to. G. Lee tells stories of being part of these crowds, usually not participating, but watching from the sidelines as they tore apart people's homes and businesses and renamed them at times. So she tells one story of a business that was called Great Prosperity, and because prosperity was seen as four olds and exploitation, it had to be, the sign on the door had to be torn down and renamed. So G. Lee says, quote, Although what we had smashed was no more than a piece of wood, we felt we had won a victory in a real battle. End quote. To me, that's interesting there. It's just the certainty of the whole thing. The absolute certainty that they were doing the right thing as they were doing this, and the feelings of being proud as you rip down somebody else's livelihood. And not everyone was as enthusiastic about this when she went home and told her mom and dad about this particular instance. They were not as enthusiastic as she hoped they would be. G. Lee says, quote, Chairman Mao's campaign to destroy the four olds was even more important than the others. The newspapers and the radio said so. I knew the movement was vital to our country's future, and I did not understand how mom and dad could not be interested in it, end quote. At first here, G. Lee is taking part in the movement, and she's confused as to why her parents aren't really drinking the Kool-Aid like she is and like the rest of her classmates in school are, and like many people in these roving bands of revolutionaries are. And you have to wonder why the mom and dad don't. Perhaps it was the memory of the Great Leap Forward Or perhaps just the knowledge that eventually this mob is going to turn on them because they have that so-called negative class status. But to G. Lee and the rest of the cultural revolutionaries, destroying the four olds felt like a real battle. And for each sign that got torn down or theater that got renamed or business that got ransacked, it felt like a victory. And it gave these young revolutionary kids and the group 
more energy for each supposed victory that they achieved. The whole four olds thing began seeping into all aspects of society, not just from political background and political ideology and business type and all that stuff, but now to just the way people dressed. And Ji Li and her other students began policing this. She tells a story of a guy who gets humiliated and has his pants cut open in front of a big crowd of people because apparently he wasn't wearing the correct revolutionary pants. She says, quote, He stood on the sidewalk, awkward and humiliated, trouser legs flapping around his ankles, socks falling down. A tuft of hair hung over his forehead. He looked at his pants, pushed up his glasses nervously, and quickly glanced around. Our eyes met. Immediately, he turned away. End quote. G. Lee talks about feeling bad for him, but ultimately she blames him for dressing that way. So he brought this on himself. I think it's important to linger here for a second because this tells you something about groupthink and the crowd mentality. G. Lee knows, I think, in her conscience or whatever you want to call it, that she's doing something wrong and she feels wrong, but ultimately she puts the blame on him for bringing this upon himself. So it's sort of like an ends justify the means mentality where I'm doing something that feels wrong, but this person brought it on himself and he's the one really to blame. And once you absolve yourself of any of the responsibility for the actions that you take, then all of a sudden the door is open for individuals and especially crowds of people to start doing horrible things. And as the Cultural Revolution went on and on, it would get worse for anyone who was in a traditional authority position. Traditional authority figures were not to get respect. They were seen as four olds, so teachers, elders, grandparents, parents were often disrespected, beaten, tortured, questioned, and sometimes worse during the Cultural Revolution. Of course, while this is happening inside the party and inside what was known as the Red Guards, which was the group of students that Mao mobilized, there was infighting over who could be more pure, who could exhibit less of the four olds, and who could expose more of these sinister four old ideas. Going along with this, one of the big initiatives at G. Lee's school and schools just like it was the creation of what was called Dazabao. And these were big posters that criticized people and ideas that were not revolutionary enough. And for G. Lee, at first, this was the education system. The students basically were given permission to take over the school. Teachers were gone or had their roles minimized, and the students were told to write thoughts about, about their teachers. And they were expected to really hammer their teachers in public and put these big posters on the walls of the city and the school and anywhere that they could put it that would be visible. Here's G. Lee talking about it. Quote, All school classes were suspended indefinitely. All students were directed instead to participate in the movement by writing big posters, Dazabao. Dazabao were everywhere, in classrooms, along the hallways, and even on the brick walls of the schoolyard. The row of tall parasol trees that lined the inside of the schoolyard was festooned with more Dazaba, hanging like flowers from the branches. When I had read the newspaper, I had been enraged by the revisionist educational system that had been poisoning our youth for so many years. But now that I actually had to criticize the teachers who taught us every day, I could not find anything really bad to say about any of them. End quote. What's happening here is that Mao, from on high, had determined that the education system was failing China, and that's why China was going through such rough times, 
Of course, it didn't have anything to do with his policies, but he demanded that teachers be replaced and ridiculed and a much more radical worldview should be taught to the students. So now G. Lee, who, by the way, is 12 years old at this point, has to play this complicated political game where she doesn't have anything negative to say about her teachers, but if she doesn't publicly humiliate this innocent person in front of everybody else, then she's going to get suspected of being a revisionist or being a landlord or being someone that's against Mao and the revolution. She quotes one of her friends who says, quote, do you want everyone to think you have a bad political attitude? End quote. If people start suspecting her of this, then they could come after her, but they could also come after her family. And again, you see this theme of party versus family, which is what Mao is trying to do. Make everyone loyal to him instead of being loyal to the traditions of the family and old China. Ji Li also quotes a couple good examples of Dazabao that are particularly instructive here, and I think I'll share a couple. So, quote, Although teachers do not hold bombs or knives, they are still dangerous enemies. They fill us with insidious revisionist ideas. They teach us that scholars are superior to workers. They promote personal ambition by encouraging competition for the highest grades. All these things are intended to change good young socialists into corrupt revisionists. They are invisible knives that are even more dangerous than real knives or guns. For example, a student from a local high school killed himself because he failed the university entrance examination. Brainwashed by his teachers, he believed his sole aim in life was to enter a famous university and become a scientist. End quote. And here's another example G. Lee gives of a Dazabao quote. As one of its victims, I denounced the revisionist educational system. Being from a working class family, I have to do a lot more housework than students from rich families. So I have difficulty passing exams. I was forced to repeat grades three times. And I was not allowed to be a young pioneer or to participate in the school choir. The teachers think only of grades when evaluating a student. They forget that we, the working class, are the masters of our socialist country. End quote. G. Lee is reading this stuff and looking at who's writing it and realizing that a lot of these students who are writing this are students who didn't pay any attention in class and didn't seem to turn in any work that had any effort put into it. So she seems to be starting to realize here that these people are just blaming teachers for some of their own inadequacies as students. More examples here of how the teachers are poisoning the minds of the students coming from this Dazabao stuff. Quote, Teacher Lee, abuser of the young. The student had failed to hand in her homework on time, and Teacher Lee had told her to copy the assignment over five times as punishment. Another student said his teacher had deliberately ruined his student's eyesight by making them read a lot, so they could not join the Liberation Army. Still another accused Teacher Wang of attempting to corrupt a young revolutionary by buying her some bread when he learned that she had not eaten lunch. End quote. Okay, so you see what's happening here is that anybody that's deemed a anti-revolutionary or a revisionist or someone who's against the Cultural Revolution is going to get targeted. And it doesn't matter what they do. Because any action they take is going to be construed as anti-Mao, anti-communist, and for olds. Even giving a student a piece of bread for lunch is going to be deemed a horrific and evil act once the adrenaline of the Cultural Revolution has been kicked into high gear. For G. Lee, at least all of this about stuff and all of this criticizing of her teachers is beginning to make her question some of the things about the Cultural Revolution because all of these events are not adding up with the facts. All of these criticisms of her teachers and her parents and elders in the community 
isn't lining up with what she sees as factual. So she begins to have this cognitive dissonance between what the party is telling her and what she's been told her whole life versus kind of what she feels in her heart. Once these Dazabao are written, the school kind of goes on, well, at least the students go on this bizarro world field trip where they go out into the community to people's homes and businesses and post these huge posters right on the front doors or on their windows or in their lawns okay, to humiliate and accuse people of anti-revolutionary behavior. This situation also really highlights the failure of the education system here and the fact that there's just no education here. It became, during the Cultural Revolution, education became simply a machine to produce good party members. G. Lee, probably on purpose, gets assigned to her aunt, who committed the crime of wearing too much makeup, And as these crowds are humiliating her aunt, she notices that it's kind of a bizarre world, like I said. The normal leaders of the classroom, the normal people who are confident and vocal in the classroom and exhibit values and character, like herself and some of her friends, they're the ones that are in the back of the crowd, not quite sure what to do. They're the ones who maybe sense a moral quandary are stepping back and aren't sure what to do. Meanwhile, a lot more of the lackluster students in class are becoming more confident and more vocal. And they're getting in a situation here where the group is giving them an emotional charge that is bolstering their confidence and leading to groupthink, propelling the group to commit more unethical acts. Geely has to sit there watching her aunt get humiliated by a group of kids and having to, by omission, participate in the group and humiliate her own family in the process. And it's really an eye-opening situation for her. And of course, for G. Lee, the wheel of Ka is going to come around and target her. So pretty soon enough, she gets hit with a dazabao by vindictive and maybe jealous classmates. She says that the red characters on the page were like blood dripping down the page to her. Here's her describing what was written in the dazabao, which is a horrible accusation and maybe one of the worst you can make, implicating both her and her teacher. Quote, K. Chang Lee doesn't like working class kids. He only likes rich kids. He made Zhang Ji Lee the teacher's assistant for math class and gave her higher grades, and he also let her win all the math contests and awarded her a lot of notebooks. We have to ask the question what is the relationship between them after all? End quote. Ji Lee reads this in a public place with her friend, and she just stood there with her friend, and cried. Again, you have to keep in mind that this is a 12-year-old girl having to deal with this just ridiculous and, quite frankly, unnecessary situation. Like many revolutions before it, and like many revolutions that are still to come, what you're seeing here is that the Cultural Revolution was starting to drift off the beaten path a little bit, starting to drift out of control, and the cost for millions of innocent people in China, both to their reputation and their psychological state of mind, much less actual physical harm, the cost for millions of these innocent people in China would be everything. Okay, so we're about halfway through G. Lee's story here. She's beginning to question some of the 
tenets of the Cultural Revolution and some of the things she's been taught her whole life, and we'll see how it ends up for her in the next episode where we'll finish the story of Red Scarf Girl. As you probably know by now, I don't particularly love to do this end of podcast uh, yakety yak. I'm not a big fan of obnoxious Twitter posting or advertising or all that other stuff um, that kind of strikes me as a little bit disingenuous, but to each his own. Um, But every couple of episodes, I do like to pause and just say thank you to everybody here who's listening to the podcast, supporting it, telling friends about it, leaving reviews on iTunes, or emailed me with thoughts or suggestions or ideas for the podcast. I really do appreciate it, and I want to say thanks uh, to all you folks out there who are listening and supporting in all the ways I mentioned before. It's actually kind of surprising, um, you know, some of the numbers as far as people listening and uh, downloads and all that stuff that we're getting here for people that are just interested in history and psychology and philosophy and how all that stuff intersects. So I think it's pretty uh, a cool little community we've, we've got growing here and I'm happy to be a part of it. So as always, thanks for listening.